Hey, welcome to another video from Skinny Medic. One of the questions I get asked a lot about what happens in this chest, abdominal area for penetrating trauma. Like, someone gets a gunshot wound to the chest, what am I supposed to do? Do I wound pack it? Do I put a chest seal? Do I cover it up? What am I supposed to do? Even the stomach, you know, do I try to wound pack the stomach or what happens? So, it's one of the questions I want to answer in this video. So, when you're wound packing, you're actually using the muscle cavity that's been created by the penetrating trauma to fill the void. So you have an artery here that's been severed, squirting bright red blood out of the wound. Then you take your gauze and that's what you're packing into the wound, into that little cavity that's been created. So you're getting it down to the source, you're packing east, north, south, west, getting all those little crevices filled up, and you're using the muscle cavity hole there to wound pack. So it works really good in the muscular areas, legs, arms, shoulders, groin, place where there's a lot of muscle, Wound packing is a fantastic, fantastic option, but in the chest cavity, abdominal cavity, not so much. So let's start with the abdominal area here. Warning, I'm going to put a graphic up right here to cover this, so if you don't want to see anything really graphic, really nasty, you probably want to fast forward or just skip to another video. But So this is what happens in the abdominal area. The large intestines, the small intestines are all right there, and they ultimately end just kind of spilling out. And I know that looks really gross. But there's not a lot of vascular going on at the surface there. Yes, you do have some large veins and vessels going uh, down in through the abdominal area to feed the legs. But ultimately, typically there's not a lot of bleeding, especially on slashes, things like that. The intestines just kind of come out because they're so compact in there, they just kind of come out. Now, it's my understanding that when they do come out, they die very quickly. So a lot of times what happens in surgery is they just cut out the part that's come out and they reattach it, things like that. So. Uh, the best thing to do for this abdominal area here is just to cover it with a moist dressing. Just cover it with a dr dressing and try to keep it as clean as possible. And because of this, the intestines are down in the abdominal area, this is hollow organs, okay? It means they're filled with air. But, you know, there's food and stuff like that, so uh, bear with me. But they're not filled with blood. So they're considered a hollow organ. So they're really smushy. So if you went to try to put wound pack galls down in there, you're gonna need a lot of galls, like a case of combat galls. That gets expensive very quickly. So they just kind of move around and squish around. You can stick your whole hand out in there and just kind of move things around and that's not very effective. So this is kind of a rough estimate here of what the chest looks like when we open it up. You have a lung right here. The right lung is typically larger than the left lung because the heart is sitting right in here. So it's kind of have to move out of the way a little bit. You've got a trachea and esophagus coming down diaphragm running right here, liver, spleen, and intestines down below. So the lungs are filled with little air pockets, so they are really squishy. So if you had a penetrating trauma here that you're trying to wound pack, you're just pushing against air. There's nothing for the combat galls to sit against to put pressure against. There's actually a documented case where a doctor uh, performed um, a procedure in the 70s where he was, I believe he was doing surgery, his patient went into cardiac arrest, went to V-fib, so the heart was sitting here quivering. He reached his hands into the guy's chest through the rib cage and started squeezing his heart because he was in cardiac arrest and the heart wasn't pumping. So he started doing that manually with his hand. So you can move all this stuff out of the way. These are filled with air, okay? There is some blood that's obviously going in through there, but there are a lot of air is the problem. You, the diaphragm, liver, spleen, they're very vascular, they bleed. But there again, they're squishy, so you start pushing on them, they just move out of the way. So ultimately, I say all of that to say this, is the best thing you can do for penetrating trauma to the chest, abdominal area, is to seal it up, okay? Vented chest seals are the way to go now. If you have the non-vented, that's okay. But right now, the vented chest seals are the way to go. This allows pressure build up that is building up to be released through the vents. Also, that would be air or blood coming up through here. It allows it to vent out. So typically, we do try to uh, put a, an occlusive dressing, a, a, some kind of dressing like this, on the neck area, unless it's just profusely bleeding. Then you got to try to hold pressure. You wouldn't want to hold pressure on both sides. But you know, you got to control the bleeding. That comes first before airway and breathing. So trauma, penetrating trauma, I mean, there's a hole in the chest, front or back, because the lungs are on the back side as well. Put a chest seal on it and seal it up. This patient needs trauma surgery. 
So I hope this video helps. You never know when you'll be the first responder, I mean the right gear and the right training. Hey, welcome to another video from Skinny Medic. One of the questions that hap well, happens all the time. Can't talk. Alright, so this is kind of a rough joint. Joint. Wish I had a joint. Just kidding. Not really. Hey YouTube, welcome to another video from Skinny Medic. I have Rick here from American Medical Preparedness. I did a video a while back about wound packing, but he has a really cool mannequin set up here. So he's gonna walk us through wound packing real quick. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. So this uh, simulator, this wound packing simulator, is specifically designed so that you can learn how to treat uh, life-threatening wounds that are so high that they're not amenable to tourniquet placement. So your hips, your shoulders. The first thing we're going to do is we can try direct pressure. We can try dropping our knee into the inguinal area to slow that bleed. But eventually what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take a power ball. It's where you take your curlex, your combat gauze, whatever rolled uh, gauze that you have, and you're going to make a ball. You're going to sweep the wound, and you're going to feel for that warm rush of blood. And you're going to jam that power ball right up against that warm rush of blood. Next thing, you can drop your gauze, and you can start to feed it. You're going to hold pressure with two fingers while you continue to fill that channel all the way up. Now once you've got that channel up, you can take your remaining gauze and you can use it to wrap, or if it's a severe wound like this one is, you can hold that gauze and this will give you a pressure point for your Israeli bandage. At which point, you can take your Israeli bandage, place the pad on, do two wraps, pull hard and tight, do a twist for your pressure point, and that's going to create that direct pressure exactly at your site of the bleed. Another one down low. We'll complete it. Every time you get a couple more wraps in, pull tight. We'll hook our straps. The bleed is secured. We can treat this patient sh for shock and evacuate. Thank you to skinnymedic.com. Check out AmericanMedicalPreparedness.com. So like Rick was saying here, obviously if we could put a tourniquet on this, we would hold, hold pressure if that can't. Put a tourniquet on it, but what he's working here with the wound packing is for joints, for arms, shoulders, things like that. We just absolutely can't get a tourniquet on. So the wound packing here is fantastic. Uh, he used just regular gauze here, which can uh, function as well. You, know, you could use a hemostatic agent such as quick clot or C-locks here as well to do your initial packing. And if you need to, to come back with a backer, then you can use just regular gauze. But regular gauze will work just fine. Uh, just the hemostatic agent is going to work just a little bit faster. Absolutely. In our wilderness first aid classes, we teach all the time, you use whatever you have. If you've got a t-shirt, if you've got a piece of uh, handkerchief or neckerchief, whatever you carry with you as a head cover, you can absolutely, your schmog or whatever you want, whatever you want to use, just get something that's cloth in there for the blood to clot against and hold pressure until help arrives. Absolutely. I mean, improvised medicine is quick because I love my tourniquets and you know, the cat tourniquets one of my favorites but you know, I may gonna run out of there very quickly. So improvised medicine, wilderness medicine, active shooter, things like that are gonna be very important. Right. Hmm, that's pretty cool. Hey, welcome to another video from Skinny Medic. One of the questions I get asked a lot when people view my videos about the combat goals or whatever uh, video they're looking at is about its risk of blood clot. So I'm going to talk about it and going to do a video for you. So if you're not familiar with combat goals, we'll just kind of give you a quick overview real quick. This is a hemostatic agent gall. So it has galls in here. It has a hemostatic agent that's bound to the galls that we use to control major hemorrhaging. Okay, this isn't for all you got an abrasion 
This is for, oh my gosh, that's a lot of blood. So I've done a couple of videos on this, and one of the videos I talked about was the difference between the black and the green. At the time, there was a difference, but now there's no difference. So they both have the x-ray strip here. So uh, no difference there now. So this is for used for, oh my gosh, that's a lot of blood. What we use it primarily for is for bleeding this, like, oh my gosh, in between like the shoulders up in here uh, and the groin because we can't get a tourniquet up here. So it's easier to wound pack now. We don't wound pack the chest or abdominal cavity. We just seal it up. But up here in the shoulder, things like that, you can wound pack. So those are easier to do with this. So another option for wound packing is if you put a tourniquet on out of your trauma kit, and you're going to be a long time before you can get to medical care. I'm talking past five, six hours, day or two, or whatever the circumstances are. But you are not going to get help anytime soon. Well, you can't leave a tourniquet on forever, obviously. And you really pass a few hours, you start getting some issues. So you will see some guys talk about in, in long-term care is that you put the tourniquet on, you see the wound. Now you can wound pack it, wrap an Israeli band, a pressure bandage around it, and then you slowly release the tourniquet over a couple hours or an over an hour or something like that so you're going to see some of those uses but the main reason we use this for out of our trauma kit is for like in the shoulder and the groin area to wound pack for oh my gosh that's a lot of blood so back to our original question is is this going to increase our risk for blood clots so if we're bleeding out like oh my gosh that's a lot of blood because you shot me or i got shot um blood clots are a great thing they're going to stop the bleeding but if it's a medical scenario where you're having a heart attack or you're having a stroke, blood clots are bad. So uh, he can kill you, obviously, uh, or he cause you have a heart attack, cause you have an ischemic stroke. So I guess in the inherent nature of what the combat gauze is doing is because it's increasing the clotting process. Uh, basically, it's taking the blood, making it thicker around the site. I guess, yes, there is an inherent risk when you're using combat gauze to uh, for the risk of a stroke and heart attack when you're using it. Now, the Army, military, they're using it on young uh, military uh, men and women who are fit and in good shape, so there's probably no worry about that. But if you do have someone that you're using it, combat galls, and they have like a fib, uh, they have a history of heart attacks, a history of strokes, they're on blood thinners, yes, I, I guess you are going to increase the risk of a heart attack. But you're using this for, oh my gosh, that's a lot of blood, my buddy's going to bleed out my patient's going to bleed out, my partner's going to bleed out. Um, so for me, I'm going to keep using this. I'm going to keep using it in my trauma kit and I'm going to keep storing it because I'm using this for if I don't use this, someone's going to die. So we may have to deal with the heart attack or the stroke later, but let's get the bleeding stopped. If there's no red blood cells left inside the body, it doesn't matter if you had a heart attack or a stroke. You don't have any red blood cells to carry oxygen and you die. So. Keep using this stuff, okay? Obviously, if you're going to use it on elderly patients that have the risk factors, just be aware of it, but keep using it. So I hope this video helps. You never know when you'll be the first responder. Remember the right gear and the right training. And if you missed my last video, then I obviously had the right gear for you, but now I have the right classes for you. So 2017 in South Carolina, I'm going to have classes. So if you missed that video, go back. It'll be up here. Click on that. So. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for all the support. So first of all, if, if so first off, if you're not so first off, if you're not familiar with combat galls, this is a hemostatic agent that has uh, galls. Bleh.